hopefully this works. Hopefully it records to where it needs to go. So we'll start the video here. Um, I'm Matthew. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a GitLab debugging techniques video. Techniques video, GitLab debugging techniques uh, from a support engineering perspective. Uh, we'll move to Justin actually next. Um, then Justin, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Justin Pamelo. I'm a support engineer in Auckland, New Zealand, and I've been here for coming up two years now. And the only claims to fame I could think of about myself are that I'm probably the least youngest GitLab support engineer on the team, and that I am quite easily confused. Hence, it's great to work through these debugging techniques and things <laughs> repeatedly for me. Okay, and I'm Matthew. I joined GitLab in April 2020, wears glasses, not as cool as Lee, and I've worked on a lot of tickets, although I can't claim that I'm an expert on any specific thing. I just worked on a lot of tickets. Uh, so this video is about GitLab debugging techniques. It's originally focused or not targeted. It's the support engineering group is uh, the people in mind. That's who we're trying to uh, make this presentation for but it's for everyone. So we're gonna use terms like customers and uh, point to specific channels within uh, Slack that we'd be using as a support group, but they're open to anybody within GitLab. If you're viewing this presentation outside of the GitLab organization, I'm sorry, you won't be able to view some of these internal channels or discussions, uh, but they're there uh, for us at least. Uh, I want to mention that this is kind of uh, version two of a video that Lee had made uh, many years ago. Uh, in this slideshow is uh, an original video and original deck link. And I'll try to make this presentation accessible outside of the uh, GitLab organization. Uh, and then you can view it later. Uh, the reason why we need, I felt we needed to remake this was because the original video was showing its age. It had a lot of great uh, information, had tips on uh, things to look out for, but a lot of those things are not really useful anymore. There's just a lot of changes since the last one. The last presentation uh, excluded a lot of, didn't exclude, it just didn't have a lot of information. The last presentation was made around version 11. We have a lot of new things. A lot of this was already on the roadmap in version 11, but these are things that have been either more mature or been added or things to just make it easier for us as support engineering to do our jobs. And I just noticed that little last bullet point's a little bit odd. So I'll have to fix that later. Um, so we'll start with the common problem areas and a walkthrough. Um, in the original presentation, Lee had this big uh, chart with the, the GitLab architecture. And this is available in our docs. You can, uh, I always say, check the docs. Uh, it's part of our troubleshooting too. Just check the docs. Uh, how I always reference things. Uh, so in the docs is this architecture chart. In Lee's original video, he referenced this chart and pointed to various uh, portions of it as he was going through this walk through section. Now, I don't really want to go through this chart again because it became massive. It's huge now. So if we zoom in this little section, this Puma section, we'll see that it's just this tiny piece in this massive puzzle. And GitLab is just huge now. So uh, this, I want to mention this specifically because we won't be able to walk through everything. We won't have every single problem addressed. And there's so many different facets and different pieces of GitLab that we won't be able to do everything. But we can go through some of the common ones. And many of them are still similar to the ones in the original video. Uh, but we won't be doing any of this architecture break anymore. Wei Ming actually has another video about Architecture 101 that we can reference and use as part of uh, our learning if we're using this as a learning uh, presentation. Uh, so we won't be doing the architecture breaks anymore, but it's very important that you take a look at the documentation and use this information when you're debugging GitLab because, for example, if there's a certain component that's not working as expected, you need to you can use this to check to see what it, what might be the cause, like uh, what component is connected to what. So. Uh, we'll start with the a scenario, for example, Puma errors. So uh, Puma is kind of the core app, Rails. It is uh, things that it controls <laughs> the core app of uh, GitLab. 
uh, they're in troubleshooting this. There are four logs we should pay attention to. Um, and these are available in our docs, but we almost always have to look at these types of logs whenever we're troubleshooting almost anything in GitLab. So whenever we request information from a customer, we'll almost always ask for these logs, unless we know exactly what's going on. But there's a little asterisk in there. Uh, so for example, we'll see this Puma memory killer. We'll see it in the Puma STD out log. Uh, this is a very common error. And there's a, a way to fix this within the logs and generally just to increase the memory. If this happens too frequently, or if it happens uh, consecutively through many, many workers, then this is a problem. It should be addressed. And we can take a look at the docs to see uh, how to increase it. This is something that has popped up again over the years. This is something that was uh, very, very common a couple of years ago. It kind of fell off because our memory usage was much better, but started popping up again more recently, in my opinion. Um, this is just something uh, that kind of pops up. What's old is new again is something I think about when I see the Puma memory killer errors. Uh, so in GitLab, we see 500 errors, and 500 errors are server-side errors. So for example, 502s, it's just Puma is not available. 503s, those occur. Uh, I don't think they're as rare as uh, they're rarer, but they're not really rare. They're more common than like, I can't think of another error. It's just these are the three most common 500 errors. 500 is probably the most common error. It means that um, something failed. The expected uh, thing that the, the thing that you expect failed. Essentially, when the Puma app was trying to retrieve some data or something for the app itself, uh, it failed in retrieving the data through timeouts, or it didn't match the expected uh, data in the in the database or something, or it just didn't exist. Uh, this is a common error. Uh, so this is something that we can see in the logs. And 500 errors are, I would say, easier because they provide a full trace of the error. And there's something we can kind of troubleshoot and narrow down a little bit quickly. Uh, additionally, when you see a 500 error in the UI, there's al always a correlation ID. And I'll talk about this a lot, a lot later, um, especially about correlation ID and, and logs. Another one is deadline exceeded. This was a common error quite a few years ago and mostly attributed to Giddily being slow uh, because of disk problems. Uh, either the disk performance was not keeping up with what Giddily demanded of it, or Giddily was just uh, requesting too much. I, I mean, this is essentially the same thing worded twice. Uh, but nowadays it's more of a red herring error. We'll see this a lot uh, in the logs, just uh, move past this when you're if you see lots of these in the logs uh, it could be a problem but if you see this once in a while I wouldn't rely on this to uh, tell you whether or not something is correct and if you look at the timestamps you can see that this is from Lee's original presentation from 2019 so this is a very old error but it's kind of new again it's popping up but uh, uh, look beyond this one because it's not always a uh, disk performance error nowadays so uh, Lee has this really great concept about uh, scared customers and savvy customers. Scared customers are those who request a problem or tell us about a problem that they're experiencing and they don't always include the full problem description. For example, uh, we were seeing a 500 error when we visit all repo and all repo is not very clear. Is it all repos? Is it one repo? Is it a group? Is it... Uh, is it pushing or pulling? It's not very specific. Or users can't see stuff. Please help was an actual error we received just a few days ago in an emergency ticket. Uh, so these are scared customers that don't fully understand the problem that they're experiencing. Uh, and uh, we want to make them more savvy customers. Uh, so what we do with an unclear problem is we start with a problem description. What is the user describing? What are they expecting to see? what and where is the error occurring? Uh, so if they have 500 errors uh, or 503s, what are they experiencing? We get a GitLab OSOS, which is a set of logs. 
this is a really great project. Um, and I'm going to mention a few times, it's going to be mentioned quite a few times in this presentation because it's very, very, very good output. Uh, providing a full trace and correlation ID, you can get the full trace either from, well, from the logs. If you're getting the, the full trace, it's definitely from the logs. Correlation ID can be presented in the UI or the logs. So when the user sees a correlation ID, we can uh, look that up in the logs. Uh, and this is some somewhat of a new thing, seeing the correlation ID in, in the UI, uh, presenting that to the user, asking them for this correlation ID. So these are things that we request from users. Um, if they don't have this information, it just takes a long time to debug. We just don't know what it is. Uh, it's really hard to troubleshoot a problem when you don't know what the problem is. When you take your car to the mechanic and it just doesn't make that sound anymore, you just don't know how to fix the problem because you don't know where the sound is coming from. The mechanic doesn't know how to recreate it. It's just uh, really difficult to do. And also we have to define a common language, so there's terms. Defining a common language is important too, and I really want to mention this one because it's not about English. It's not about getting the same language, uh, like spoken language. It's more about terms. If someone uses a phrase about their runners not working expected, uh, they they need to be clear. Is this uh, like a GitLab runner that's not running, or is this something in the pipeline that's not running on the runner? Defining a common language and where things occur really matter. Uh, and we need to get the customers from that scared state to a savvy state. And this is the way, these are ways we can do it. So for example, a good problem description is we are seeing a 500 error when we visit this repo. So uh, sometimes they'll have an image link to a 500 error, but if it doesn't include that correlation ID, it's not very useful. It's just that we know that there's a 500 error happening. If they include a timestamp, that's better. So if they include this correlation ID, it's good. If they paste it in the ticket, it's even better. If they have accompanying logs included with the ticket when they, they uh, submit the ticket, that's, that's great. And if they paste the entire stack trace, that's a great way to start off a ticket to debug a problem. We can't debug a problem unless we know what the problem is. Uh, even working towards that problem, we can't find good solutions to work towards that problem unless we know where to look. And if a scared customer does, isn't able to tell us, it just delays everything. So we need to make the customers into more savvy customers. So troubleshooting the problem or debugging the problem, uh, we have several ways of doing it. In the past, it was always recommended to do things like check a database or the Rails console or API, and which one should we use? Well, API, if, if you can, for example, if they're trying to query a bunch of MRs and they're just not displaying on the page, use the API to see if you can query those MR, MRs during the uh, normally, and if they return in the time that you expect. So if the MR is just blank page of MRs and it's showing a little bit of a loading screen, you use the API and it shows up fine, maybe there's something else happening, maybe a UI or UX issue or something. So we also wanna choose between Rails console or Postgres. And I recommend going the one you're most comfortable with uh, because you don't want to make mistakes. It doesn't mean be afraid. Definitely, if you're not comfortable with either or even just one or the other, sometimes you need to use both. Make sure that you uh, get someone to help, someone that um, might understand a little bit better or just run, run it by someone. Uh, it really depends on the circumstances. And I, I just want to make sure that. Um, to start, if you're with a scared customer, you don't want to start uh, giving them a bunch of commands to start pasting the chat and uh, or start pasting into their console and then just start running without them understanding it. Uh, we want to avoid that. And if you're not comfortable using those commands, then uh, go through them. Uh, so for example, um, for example, Rails console, move to the Rails console because I'm most comfortable with using the Rails console. And I think a lot of us in support engineering are. The original uh, presentation that Lee had made had talked about using, um, sorry, my screen is jumping. So the original uh, 
presentation that Lee had made talked about the Rails console uh, being kind of a dangerous place, but the Rails console has improved lately. And we have, um, we've really gotten it so that uh, you can stay kind of within Rails. You don't go off the Rails. With the active record, especially, it's hard to break things. So uh, whenever you're talking to a customer and trying to work through a problem, make sure you test the commands, ensure that the customer is not copying and pasting all of them at the same time, go line by line and paste them. Have someone to look over your commands. Um, the reason why I mentioned the line by line thing is because if you paste it all in one big glob, sometimes it could throw, uh, could have formatting errors that you didn't expect, like carriage returns in the wrong spot or something is happening too, too quickly, like a, a read command that is uh, being posted. We need to verify that the, the things that we're pasting in the command are the things we're expecting. And I think that's part of the tech, get the debugging technique is that we, we want to find an expected state and putting uh, just random commands in the Rails console is just not the way to get that to the expected state. Uh, so for example, the, the Rails active record, when you're looking at a model, like a, a model of a, a code, uh, for example, if you're pushing an MR or displaying an MR and you're looking at the model of that MR, how it's displayed in the UI, you have sets of data that you can look at within the Rails console. And if there's, uh, if you're just viewing the Rails console and you're looking at a certain set of data and it just doesn't display or errors, it's a good way of telling where the 500 error happens. Um, you can also recreate the 500 errors sometimes within the Rails console if the data is unexpected or stored unexpectedly. And uh, use the PP and the model to display a pretty output formatting. We have information on the Postgres console, but I'm going to leave this one to Justin to talk about a little bit because I am personally not comfortable with using the Rails console because it could be dangerous. But Justin, would you be able to talk about the Rails console for a minute? Uh, sure. So when I started at GitLab, I, I knew my way around Postgres, cons uh, Postgres reasonably well. I knew my way around Rails, not at all. So it was the one that I started off using to look at them. Um, I look at data in the database, but I, I do totally agree um, with Matthew that if you can get the hang of the Rails console for a lot of the applications um, with debugging things and testing things, it is the way to go because it has all the logic built in there as well as to what GitLab does and how the various um, tables are grouped together into relationships and things. So um, well, Postgres does come in handy just for checking sometimes uh, what, is in a, um, what is in a table or else what the uh, schema of a table is um, to make sure it's got all the columns and indexes and things that it wants. So, um, I mean, you can make updates to data in GitLab through both the Rails and the Postgres console, but the Postgres console would allow you to make changes in isolation from other things. So you could easily wind up updating a uh, merge request, but not updating some other record that needs to be uh, kept in, in sync with it or consistent with it. So. I do suggest you don't use Postgres for updating data, deleting, um, inserting. It's just for looking at tables and schemas. Um, unless you absolutely have to. And when you do have to, often there will be a known workaround for a problem and it will have been tested and tried by other people. So you can be um, reasonably confident that it will work, but always be aware of what you're about to update. If you do the that, um, make sure you verify it for a select the same where clause so before you go ahead and do an update or a delete or something like that. Um, to get into the database console from a standalone omnibus installation or Docker installation, you can just run gitlab-psql and that'll connect to the local database. Um, if your database is hosted externally, that won't work. So you can use GitLab Rails DB console minus minus database main instead. Uh, that will ask you for the um, password for the configured GitLab user as per the gitlab.rb file. So you'll need to know what that is uh, to get into the console. Um, and really the only tip I had <laughs> for, using, for using the console is the backslash x option, which will change the output formatting um, sort of vertically rather than horizontally. So you don't get so much wrapping of lines of output um, and it's a lot easier to read. And that's, that's that.
Yeah. So uh, one thing too is that the I I didn't mention it here. I think it was the other slide. So here I wrote that migrations are direct database changes. Uh, and when you look at the migration files, they you will see that they are database entries. Insert into table or uh, create a new table or something along those lines. I'm not Postgres wizard, but migrations. If we have a failed migration, Postgres console is a great way to troubleshoot that one. Uh, so I'll move on to logs. <laughs> logs are very important. I listed it quite a few times in the presentation uh, because it's it's very, very important. Uh, now, the slide show is only one single slide about logs, but it's probably the most important thing because we really need the logs to trigger, try to figure out what a problem is. To see what the issue is, we really need to find out the logs. We can get information from a 500 error, and we can try to get some information from the findings, but the logs are most important. So if you check the docs, I included a link in this presentation, the docs, uh, the docs, check the docs, because it includes a list of uh, all the logs we have and examples, which are really great because you can see what an expected uh, log output is supposed to look like, ex the expected log output. Um, and then the correlation ID, which I've mentioned several times so far, if you see this within the browser, you can get that correlation ID from the user and you can search the logs for it. This is important on SAS too, because when a SAS user has an issue and they they give you that correlation ID, you can go into our log system and look it up. When you, you have the correlation ID, you'll see it across multiple services too. So you can see whether uh, Puma was behaving as expected, if Gidley was behaving, ex behaving as expected. Correlation ID is very, very important. And you can see that in the API too, if you're using that with the X request ID header, it's, it's really, really uh, good. I use this a lot too when I'm searching through logs and I see a 500 error occurred one place that I want to see if this is attributed to the same problem that the user is reporting, or is it just another 500 error that they happen to be experiencing? Are they even related? So uh, it's really, really good to get this uh, correlation ID uh, when you can when the user can provide it. So stack traces and back traces are great because they can show you where the code failed. And this is really cool working at GitLab because we can just kind of link directly to where the code failed. Uh, so you can go on gitlab.com and then find the version that the user uh, is using. You can find that where the stack trace fails and you can just point to this, this section of the code is where you're having a problem. And this is useful too, because you can use that, that section of code to find the model and go back to the Rails console and then just check to see if the model is uh, presenting as expected. And you can just query that model and see if, uh, or query that record, I mean, and see if uh, it's still throwing errors or try to repair it using that. Uh, we'll leave repair to another time, but we, logs, logs are vitally important to figuring out the, uh, the problem. And if you just want to skip to a single log, exceptions JSON log is uh, the best log to use. Um, I think anyway, you can just kind of skip to it. Uh, it has all the Puma uh, in GitLab dash Rails uh, folder. You can see the exceptions JSON log because it'll just show all of the exceptions in across uh, application production and uh, workhorse logs too, I believe. And I mentioned the J JSON logs because they're somewhat new compared to version 11. They've been more and more, um, they've been added uh, or improved more and more since the the previous presentation. Um, this this is just uh, this is really important. Like if we if we don't find an error, you just can't find the root cause. Uh, it's just very very hard. So logs 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 logs. Just keep asking the customer for the logs. Uh, if they can't provide the logs, for example, they're on a closed system. Uh, ask them to look for the logs and just know where the logs are at. You can even point them to the documentation. Tell them where this the logs exist and then that, then ask them to look in the logs for that type of error look for a specific type of thing like a 500 error or use that correlation id that they got from the browser and then look for that in the logs you can ask the customer to do this if they're i've worked with customers that just can't share any of the log information they can't do a gitlab sos they can't share even just a snippet of the logs but if we ask them to find the logs they can provide small outputs that are 
very much redacted that we can use to try to find uh, the root cause of the error. And with that, I'm going to pass this on to Justin. And Justin, you should be able to share your screen. And I will stop sharing mine. Okie doke. There we go. I think. See it. All right. <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, coming on. You must be a little bit parched after all that talking. <laughs> um, so, section four tools available. There are tools available and they are good to use. So, uh, we've mentioned this already a few times GitLab SOS. So, this is a really, really important and helpful tool for us in support um, and it saves us and the customer a lot of uh, time in the first instance when investigating a problem and we want to know as much about their environment as possible as quickly as possible so uh, this is a project and there's uh, links to it in the uh, handbook and um, you can just go to it. There's, you can run it uh, either by cloning the project and running the command locally on the GitLab instance, or you can run it directly by a curl without having to, um, to clone anything. So the GitLab SOS, uh, when it runs, it takes 30 seconds or so to, to or a minute to run, and it does um, a couple of key things. Uh, it'll take uh, a bunch of snapshots of various metrics from the system. Uh, such as PS and uh, VM stat and IO stat and those kinds of commands, um, just to try and get a picture of how the uh, OS is performing at the time and what kind of workload it's under. Um, it will also gather a bunch of system information, um, for instance, whether SE Linux is enabled, which is a really useful thing to know because some very um, obscure problems can be caused when SE Linux is misbehaving. Um, it'll do a listing of CPUs, how many CPUs, memory, disk space, so you can uh, tell if the system has run out of space, for instance, which might be causing the problem. Uh, and it also collects um, a copy of the current log of all the different GitLab services uh, that are on the system, as well as the OS uh, syslog or messages. Um, so, all sorts of things in one place uh, with one documented way of, for the customer to create the file and attach it to the ticket. And then you're um, off to a good start to, to try and get to the bottom of whatever the issue is. Um, one thing to mention is that the latest versions of GitLab SOS, if you run it uh, after cloning the project, so the, the first sort of way of running GitLab SOS, it will include a sanitized copy of the GitLab.rb configuration. Uh, in the SOS, which is also really helpful because that's sort of the other thing we, we tend to have to ask um, customers for so we can see what their current settings are. Uh, but just note that it won't do that if the customer runs it directly using curl. Uh, so that, that file may not be included and you'll have to ask for it separately. Um, now I was just informed just before we started here that uh, one of our engineers, Kenneth, has actually in the process of working on enhancement to get that SOS that will allow you to specify a time range for the logs that you want to include in it. So as I said, at the moment, it will just include the most recent, the current active log file uh, for each service. Uh, and on a busy system, those files can get rotated uh, very quickly. So we do always recommend the customer reproduces whatever problem they're having and then immediately runs the GitLab SOS so that it will have those errors in the current log, but often, even if it's run 15 minutes or half an hour later, you might find that um, the time period involved is not included. So uh, that will be a, a good enhancement when, um, when it gets released. Now, the GitLab SOS, uh, when you get it back, it's a, it's a compressed tar file, so you extract it to your, to your local machine and it extracts it into a hierarchy of folders and log files and things. And then you can visually inspect those yourself um, or grip for information out of them. But we also have some other projects that people have created to um, help with the interpretation and 
housing of those um, SOS files. So the two key ones are fast stats, which is specifically for extracting performance information from the GitLab log files. Um, and it'll show you the number of operations that are different types of operations that are performed, how long they took, where they spent their time, whether it was in database access or queuing or CPU and that sort of thing. And the requests per second um, involved for that operation. So that's a way of, especially for performance issues when customers say the system is running slowly, uh, you can check and see is it one particular operation that's running very slowly, are there hundreds or thousands of operations requests per second being issued for it for some for something which is just overwhelming the system uh, and information like that that you can get out and you can also compare uh, particular log files statistics to the benchmarks um, for that version of GitLab to see if it's sort of behaving as ex as expected or not. Uh, so there's lots of documentation around how fast that works. It can produce uh, graphs as well, showing um, showing the, the metrics. So it's uh, a very powerful tool uh, for any performance related issues. Uh, and then Green Hat is another is another one which is a sort of user friendly um, text based interface into uh, a bunch of options to parse the log files, um, examine the information that's in there, print out the system uh, configuration and metrics um, and state in, in a easily read format uh, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so it's well worth having in your arsenal of tools as well. Um, one thing to remember though with SOS is it's, it's very, it's often the very first thing we ask on a ticket, um, unless the customer is one of those very uh, special, <coughs> excuse me, special ones who actually includes SOS with their first of uh, the first contact on the ticket. Uh, but often the very first thing we'll go back to them and ask for is, can you please send us a GitLab SOS from your instance? Now, for a large installation, uh, maybe using a reference architecture, um, they may have upwards of 30 uh, nodes configured as part of a um, you know, 5,000 user GitLab reference architecture. Um, and even for the non-reference architectures, they may have multiple Rails nodes, multiple, they will have potentially multiple Gitly nodes, um, multiple cyclic nodes. So when you ask them, can I get a uh, GitLab SOS, please, you do have to be a bear in mind, you might be asking them to do this across a dozen or more instances at once. So um, it's still a very useful thing, uh, worthwhile thing to ask them for, and often that's the only way to get the information, but uh, just bear in mind, it can be quite a lot of work for the customer. Um, So along with GitLab SOS, um, which is used for our Docker and Omnibus based installations, um, we have Kube SOS, which is used for our Helm chart based installations. Um, it, it's the same idea. It's designed to be a sort of a, a one line tool, the command you can run to get a file together containing a whole bunch of useful information about how your Kubernetes cluster is set up and also collecting all the GitLab logs. Uh, it's um, a project that you that you clone and, and then run the run the command. Um, it does require you to run it from a machine that has kubectl uh, access to the cluster so that it can interrogate it and get the required information. And you do have to tell it which namespace in your cluster the GitLab is installed in because for many of the commands it runs are namespace specific. So if GitLab isn't in your default namespace and you don't specify the default uh, the namespace, you'll get a bunch of information back that isn't all that helpful. Uh, some of the key things it does include though, it includes the currently applied um, Helm chart values that have, that have been used to configure the GitLab deployment. Um, and it also includes uh, the log files from all of the um, different services that run in pods uh, within the cluster. So you'll have sidekick pods, you'll have uh, web service pods, Gitly pod, uh, and you'll get a log file produced from each of those. Now, unlike the uh, GitLab SOSs, which collect um, the individual log files for each service uh, in a single nicely formatted file. 
the Kubernetes logs from a pod will include logs from all the containers running within that pod. And you'll, that means that, for instance, for the web service um, pod, you'll have uh, workhorse logs mixed up with um, Rails type logs. And the whole thing is a little bit of a, of a jumble of logs from different services. And if you do want to apply those logs to something like uh, fast apps, you will need to do some um, selective gripping of the lines that are relevant from, from those files to get them into a format that fast steps can, can run against. Uh, and the other really useful thing in the file is the um, events logs from the cluster. So often with Kubernetes, the issues aren't necessarily to do with how GitLab is being configured or installed. It's to do with the cluster itself. And it may be running out of resources. It may be evicting pods that are because the memory in the, in the environment is too too low. And often you'll get information about those uh, from the actual cluster event logs. Um, and you can go back to the customer and say, well, actually, this you need to increase the memory you have for your nodes are running too much, too many pods, and they're, they're evicting them. Um, and as per the GitLab SOS, it is best to run this as soon as possible after reproducing whatever the problem is, because the um, Kubernetes logs can um, rotate for, or, yeah, rotate and you won't see the information that you need. Okay, so uh, this section is just about the different kinds of um, deployments and ways you can deploy GitLab. And I guess this has changed a lot over the years um, as, as more and more options are developed um, and made available. So geo troubleshooting is sort of a thing unto itself in a way because it's not a geo is, is our um, multi-site deployment method, which primarily is about bringing copies of uh, repositories and database information into different geographical locations that are closer to the end users um, to make things like cloning uh, and you know pushing repos and things faster for people because they're they're um if they're in another part of the world and they're trying to access the GitLab server somewhere far away then it will take a lot longer uh, but the other thing that geo provides is a disaster recovery uh, mechanism whereby you can have your primary site your replicated secondary site that has been used by people in that region and then if something happens to the primary you can switch over to the secondary and not have any loss of data uh, or much in the way of a downtime. Um, so it's quite a lot of moving parts involved in how that replication uh, between the primary and the secondary is performed for all the different kinds of objects in the GitLab environment. So you have your database, which is being replicated by a Postgres. You have your repositories, which are being replicated. And then you have all your different kinds of uh, objects like uh, uploads or that's their snippets and, and things like that, which need to be transferred from one site to the other, uh, preferably or, you know, as soon as possible after they're changed. So we have a whole um, age of GitLab troubleshooting tips and, and processes in our documentation. And it's really worthwhile for a GitLab, uh, for a Geo problem to start there and just work through those and see if they relate to the to the issue that the customer is reporting. Um, now, I was just going to mention one, one tip in the troubleshooting for, for GEO is to just reset the secondary site, which performs the full resync of all the data from the primary to the secondary. Um, I think that's that's an option that, that is certainly uh, used to, to fix problems. And I think because GEO is such a... Uh, Dynamic, you know, it's, it's being updated all the time. Bugs are being fixed, and new features are being in, uh, deployed. That um, possibly there are a lot more cases where that, that is required was required in the past as a as a last resort to, to get things working um, again. I'd say that these days it's possibly less less necessary to go there. And also, if you are going to suggest it, just bear in mind that it's sort of a you know 
nuclear option in terms of you're going to knock out the DR side and, and it may take hours or days to, to get the sinking back and sink again. So it's not something the customer may be that keen on doing. So um, just uh, be a bit sensitive around that when you're suggesting it and explore other options first. Uh, and all sorts of things can come into play when troubleshooting um, geo issues, uh, apart from problems with GitLab itself. Um, there's a lot of performance aspects that can cause things to get out of sync and uh, backlogs to develop. So you really have to be looking at the Bitly Prefect network and database performance at both sites potentially. Um, if there's a problem with replication just not happen happening as quickly as it um, as a customer wants it to or as it should be. Uh, so reference architectures. So there's a lot of work again in this area has, has happened in recent years. So we have our reference architectures um, that we recommend to customers as a reliable, tested and benchmarked way to provision the GitLab environment for a particular user count based on certain assumptions about what typical users do. So we have um, reference architectures going from 500 or 1,000 users up to 50,000 users. And uh, you can see all the specs for those in terms of machine types and numbers and um, architectures in the documentation. Um, the, so the reference architectures provide high availability. Uh, now, just put a star next to that, just to remind me to mention that there is some caveats around that that are mentioned in the docs. And, and one of those things is around the Prefect database. Um, it's not it's not HA um, in the reference architectures unless you host it externally on a on a database uh, database platform that that is highly available. Uh, but otherwise, nearly as far as I know, nearly all, all the other feature parts of GitLab can be provisioned in, in a distributed way to make them highly available. Um, Reference architectures can be consolidated down onto fewer nodes without losing that high availability. So if you're troubleshooting an issue, you might be tempted to say to a customer, oh, you know, you've got, you're having performance problems, you should deploy a reference architecture, have a look at the 3000 user one, and have a look at that, and this says you need to deploy 28 or 31 nodes or something. And I had a customer who was rightfully <laughs> concerned about that suggestion because, um, they just didn't have the workload as, as associated with a 3000 user system, but they wanted high availability in their environment. So um, you can reduce that down, but the risk you take there is just that the performance won't be as good as it um, is guaranteed to be by the reference architectures. Um, we also have the cloud native hybrid options where we combine Kubernetes deployments um, of the sort of stateless parts of GitLab, and then we use on the bus deployments of uh, GitLab and Prefect to store um, repository data. And that also leverages object storage um, to store the other information externally. Um, and sometimes, when it, again, when it comes down to performance, um, in GitLab, having more nodes can be a viable alternative to just having uh, single larger nodes um, and it might even cost customers less. So we do have to work through what the customer's actual environment and requirements are. And if they're having performance issues, then these are all different options that can be suggested. Um, and hopefully linked to in our docs so the customer can do their own research and decide which ones are most appropriate for them. Oh, so, um, yeah, so I probably mentioned some of this already. Um, one, so one thing to do with, with large environments and, and things like reference architectures is to um, don't just assume there might be a single instance GitLab. Um, so remember to, to find out um, before you start suggesting uh, things to do for their, to address their issue. You can find this out by asking them. Uh, you can also have a look at prior tickets because often they will have had the same questions asked for them in the past by other support engineers on other tickets and the information is there. And uh, some of our customers actually have architecture issues linked to from uh, the help desk. So you can look at those and 
see a hopefully recent architecture diagram um, and other information about them. Uh, as I mentioned before, be selective when requesting your services in large environments because that can be a lot of your services. Um, so if you only need to see sidekick logs, then just request your services from sidekick nodes. Um, and you can even reduce that down to asking for just the log files themselves if you're reasonably certain about what it is you want to want to check. Uh, and be aware that uh, they may be the environment may be using external Redis, external Postgres, and object storage, um, or they may be using those services as they are deployed um, by GitLab itself uh, as per the reference architectures options. So there's a bunch of uh, possibilities there. Um, and one thing to bear in mind, this applies to, to any um, GitLab installation in the cloud, not just reference architectures, but for performance issues, again, do be aware of the potential for a mismatch between uh, instance types and storage types on their cloud uh, compute instances. Um, if you don't have enough storage provisioned or storage of a certain type provision, then you will potentially have IO throttling uh, applied by the cloud provider and that'll cause um, you know, things to perform bad, pretty badly at times in GitLab. And um, it's worth, worth checking that out. Um, so troubleshooting cloud native, or which is how we refer to um, Kubernetes deployments of GitLab. We talked about KubeSOS. Um, and just seeing if there's anything much there that I haven't mentioned already. So yes, yeah, so logs can ro rotate quickly. Um, be aware of that. We have two files that get included in the KubeSOS. I've said sometimes because sometimes it seems that information isn't there. Um, and you have to go back and ask the customer directly for it. Uh, but that's extremely helpful, especially the user supplied values to see exactly what configuration values have been applied. Um, make sure you check the event logs as well in case the issue is not GitLab at all, but it's being imposed on it by the cluster itself due to you know, resource limitations. Or other errors, uh, network errors, DNS errors, that sort of thing, inability to pull down images from external places that, and other things external to GitLab. And um, speaking for myself, chart values for Kubernetes deployments of GitLab can be confusing. Uh, I often struggle to know exactly where they should be specified and, and what, you know, what sub subheadings should be associated with them. And so I make good use of a test, test cluster that I have um, to try things out and make sure I'm not going to tell the customer something um, that is actually incorrect or mis misformatted. All right. Ah, so the last section is about GitLab.com or SAS troubleshooting. Um, so a lot of troubleshooting of issues reported by SAS customers is similar to what we do for customers who manage their own GitLab environments. Uh, but some of the processes are also different. Um, and the one key thing, uh, well, key things that I have to remind myself constantly to remember to do this when I am dealing with a ticket, especially if it's for something that sounds like a, you know, a key part of, of gitlab.com is not working properly. And it's something that isn't specific to anything a particular customer has, has configured, um, is to check whether it's a known issue already. Um, because there's so many custom people using GitLab.com, chances are anything major will have already been reported and logged by someone else. You can save yourself a lot of time by just checking in the Slack with a, a incident management channel whether the incident has been declared relating to a particular problem. You can check our status.gitlab.com page um, for similar information. And there's also a issue tracker for the reliability engineering team that records lower priority issues or longer running known issues. And the other key thing is to check for recent, recent similar tickets. Um, and that can save a lot of time when you spend, <laughs> I've spent an hour, you know, an hour trying to figure something out, then I just suddenly have the brainwave to check and sure enough, someone else 
handle the ticket for it two hours ago and replied and all the information is there and I needn't have done anything. So uh, always remember to do that. Uh, it's a great resource of information, the help desk. If you do need to go hunting down a particular problem, um, we can't just log on and look at the logs and we can't get an SOS run. So we have tools to let us do those things instead. Uh, Kibana is the tool for searching um, our log files from all the different GitLab.com instances and components um, against the uh, Elasticsearch backend. Um, you do need to remember when you go into that to choose which log source you're interested in, whether it's Gitly or Sidekick or GitLab Rails. Um, and as Matthew mentioned earlier, having the correlation ID, which you custom with simply from the error page in, in GitLab when it occurs, is really helpful to track things down. And there is a uh, correlation dashboard available in Kibana that lets you plug in the correlation ID and then it searches across multiple log sources for any messages with that correlation ID in them, which can um, be a great time saver. Um, bear in mind, there's only seven day retention of those logs. Uh, so you need to, uh, if, if an issue the customer's reporting happened more than seven days ago, you could, you'll need to get it reproduced uh, to, to try and hunt it down. Uh, and Sentry is the other tool. So Sentry will actually collect uh, similar errors into issues. And that's a good tool for seeing as a particular type of error happening a lot over a given time period across lots of customers. Um, and if you do think you've identified an issue that hasn't been reported before, then there's processes in the handbook for using Sentry to create an issue for the uh, site reliability teams to, to look into and um, see if action needs to be taken to fix that. I think that is the end of the slideshow. Matthew, would you like to? So closing statements uh, <laughs> uh so the presentation hopefully you've learned something uh this is what we normally do in day to day at gitlab uh to troubleshoot issues and troubleshoot problems for customers and ourselves gitlab.com so uh i'm going to close it here and stop the recording take care <laughs>